Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Mani Krishnan. I'm one of the old age psychiatrists. Uh, today, we're going to discuss about the exciting, innovative project. It's a TEAS remote ECG pathway. And I've got uh, my colleagues, Lauren and Phil. Lauren? Hi, I'm Lauren Bennett. I'm the Innovations Coordinator for TEAS Eskimoia Valley's NHS Trust. And I've been helping Chris on the TEAS remote ECG pathway. And I've got Phil from HSN. Phil? Hello, my name's Phil Kyle from the Academic Health Science Network. I work alongside Charlotte Fox from the same organisation supporting TUV in um, the deployment of the TEAS remote ECG pathway across their operational boundary. Thanks so much. So let's go on to a slideshow now, please. Right. I, I, I think as psychiatrists, uh, uh, be working with people with uh, mental health problems and uh, medication, we are all aware relationship between need for cardiac monitoring uh, when people are on antipsychotic medication. Uh, there is clear uh, evidence that uh, it can cause various cardiac problems, including QT prolongation. Uh, and uh, it could also sometimes lead to sudden cardiac death. So we generally do an ECG, baseline ECG, before putting patients on a psychotropic medication, and then we would have a regular monitoring of their ECG to look at any uh, QT prolongation. However, over the pandemic in the last year, we have been limited in how we can use the ECG, specifically about initial part of the time of the pandemic for six months, we had major difficulty accessing patients, accessing ECGs, and also some of our vulnerable patients who are shielding. It was very difficult to take them, uh, take the ECG device, wire them up and get an ECG done. So, and also patients were frightened of uh, contracting infection, one-to-one uh, -one contact and various things. Next slide, please. So we thought about what can be done. And incidentally, on 23rd of March last year, uh, uh, this particular device, uh, Alive Car Cardio Mobile 6 Lady CG, which was licensed by FDA, uh, it was an incidental uh, occurrence because uh, one of the medication, I think two of the medications, one is hydroxychloroquine and the other one is azithromycin. Both these uh, medications are given as a treatment for COVID, can also prolong QT. So they faced with a similar situation. So uh, even though this device has been already developed and being used for other conditions like atrial fibrillation, FDA gave an emergency authorization specifically to use the device for QT measurement. So we thought we will use this opportunity and then use it for our um, vulnerable patients who are uh, shielding and also have less access to uh, ECG. And we decided to do a real world evaluation. Next slide, please. Lauren, do you want to explain the yeah. real world? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Krish. Um, so we decided to do a real world evaluation and got some funding from the Academic Health Science Network, Northeastern North Cumbria. And um, we got 30 devices, which we shared across six teams. Um, and we asked the teams to pilot the device with their service users and gather some feedback on this. Um, so we got feedback from our staff and service users. And if we just go to the next slide, it'll show some um, of the feedback that we got. So from our patients, we asked which device was easier out of the six lead remote ECG device or the 12 lead. And um, we asked which one was easier, more dignity, um, more private, which one was least intrusive, most comfortable, and which did they prefer on the future tests, the future ECGs. Um, and 100% of the patients said that they would prefer the six lead ECG device across all of those. Um, that's why you can't see any red um, columns because they all preferred the six lead ECG. And if we go to the next slide, we should have some 
staff feedback. So 100% of the staff said they also preferred the six lead ECG and we got some quotes from them as well. Uh, the famous quote, if you took it off me, I would cry. We had one staff member who um, couldn't actually use the six lead ECG because she had, uh, sorry, the 12 lead because she had back problems and it was too heavy. Um, so now with the six lead, she was able to use that on service users. And so 100% of our staff said that they preferred the six lead ECG. So that was really good feedback. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we also looked at some time and cost savings as well. Um, our staff reported that it saved 17.5 minutes using the six lead compared to the 12 um, and that we would save a total cost of around just over £300,000 for the whole trust per year using the six lead. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll hand back over to you, Chris. Yeah. So just uh, for information, this is the device for people who have not looked at it. But I'll just show you. Then if I take it out and then if I show you the device as well as my index finger, so you can see how tiny it is. And that's the thickness of the device. So it's fairly very small, probably as big as like a credit card uh, uh, distance and uh, it's very thin and you can put it in your shirt pocket or in your handbag. So it is a fairly and uh, the famous quote from another person was this looks like a bit of a jiggery pokery that this can do, do a recording. So uh, thanks Lauren for giving those feedback and explaining what has happened. Uh, and incidentally, uh, our uh, local North uh, Academic Health Sciences Network have given significant support for us. Thanks Phil and his colleagues, um, Charlotte and uh, all the other team members in the HSN Northeast and North Cumbria. Uh, and also uh, they have uh, made links with the NHS X uh, who, uh, you know, during the pandemic, they saw, saw this is one of the kind of important uh, pilot studies where we brought the digital innovation to our vulnerable population. So they have um, managed to give us further funding for further 144, 140 devices for an extended pilot. So we thought while we are using this opportunity to start sharing and spreading, the very fact of using this particular educational video is about how we can adapt this project and start sharing across the country. So we got another 100 devices and there's going to be 40 devices given to our neighboring trust that is CNTW and Phil has been kindly working with them uh, to get the project up and running. I think they'll be starting very soon and then NHS X uh, have procured more devices to looking at a national adoption. Next slide, please. So we've got our emails and uh, information that will be available for people to look at it. Next slide. Yeah, thank you, Phil. So if you could unshare, I'm just going to share something else just quickly. OK, so I just thought I will quickly share how we did like a the standard operating procedure or a guidance. So what we did was we thought uh, we need to show demonstrate uh, our teams how this is done. So this is just our uh, trust way of kind of trying to give a little algorithm. The app can be downloaded. Uh, we got our digital team to make it uh, allowed for our mobile trust mobile phones to be able to download the app. And then as you can see, the process will be explained and there are videos that we have produced. Uh, and they just have to hold it in their hand with two fingers and put it on the left knee. And that's all it takes and it takes 30 seconds for somebody to get the recording done. And we only use the patient identification number in, in our trust, we use an electronic record system called Paris. So we'll just put the Paris number and then the ECG can be shared as an email. 
uh, and then that that through our NHS email. Um, and with regard to QT calculation, um, I'll just what I thought while I'm here, I just thought I'll show you some ECGs. So the ECG you get is a very good quality ECG. So if I uh, expand it, you get like a clearly a clean uh, graph. So it is, uh, I'm just showing a few ECGs. So you can actually clearly look at them. So what you need is, uh, if you think of the calculation, uh, you just look at the lead two, and then you are going to measure from the start of the QRS complex to end of the T wave. And then, for example, in this particular ECG, it had nine small squares or some of the ECGs I showed. For example, if you think of that, talk one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight squares. And then if you if you were to put it on the uh, there is a you know freely available web app is there. You put the heart rate that will be in your ECG and how many small squares, and it automatically provides the uh, actual QTC. So it is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to unshare. I think on a practical level, so it is as simple as downloading the app, uh, you know, pairing it with your mobile phone, trust mobile phone, taking it to the patient. And then we've got a few other practical things we will come on to. Uh, and then using it, emailing it to the clinician, then calculating the QT interval, and then putting a clinical record on the notes, and then use your local process uh, procedures to uh, formalize it. Again, with regard to cleaning again, use your local infection prevention control process to clean the uh, device. Uh, the one thing I just want to say, alcohol can affect the glue. So as long as you're not dipping the uh, device into an alcohol solution, cleaning, you can use uh, you know regular cleaning methods, which we will put some more information on it. So Lauren, I know there are uh, multiple team members have asked various questions. So uh, I, I will go through them, but coming back to again, the remit of this particular recording uh, with regard to how we did it, what we did. So you had a clinical query, you had a need, the pandemic came along and we needed to do something right for the patient, accessibility and then digital accessibility and use of innovation. That's where we reached here. And what I want to uh, uh, probably bring Phil along here is how we can also a good practice how we pass on to sharing and spreading. So Phil, would you mind uh, summarizing how you found this work as a project management point of view from AHSN point of view, please? From an academic health science network, Northeast North Cumbria point of view, um, this has been an absolute pleasure. And this is what our organization is all about, collaborating with wonderful NHS trusts such such as Tuvi, CNTW, and many other trusts on different projects across the Northeast and North Cumbria. Um, to support um, trusts in helping people less fortunate than ourselves is always a privilege. Um, from a back office point of view, um, the Academic Health Science Network um, were in a position to identify funding sources. Um, which we applied for on behalf or assisted our trusts such as Tuvi and CNTW and other trusts again on different projects um, to identify uh, funding for a potential device and in this case the Alive Core device which Tuvi have been fantastically successful in deploying across their, their borders. Um, from a back office point of view People such as Lauren and ourselves, we we run um, a, a tools and systems process, and this is something where the clinician perhaps may not have the interest. All they all we want to do is make the process run smoothly and help the clinician deploy a, devo a device in the most simplest of way 
ways um, and for the benefit of the patient. Um, we collectively liaise directly with our clinicians and after the process has been deployed, we look from a reflection point of view by bringing everyone together and how we could have done this better. And then jointly, we are looking to spread this across boundaries on a bigger scale. So it's, it's just fantastic to be involved with, with brilliant clinicians and back office staff from all trusts across the regions. Thank you, Phil. That's really helpful. And again, it, we were just talking before so we started the recording. None of us couldn't have done any of thing on our own. It's a collaborative effect, effort, you know, freeze up clinician time, but also the innovation, you know, Lauren's uh, job as an innovation coordinator really made a valuable thing. She worked along with the AHSN and then the AHSN have got their influence and connections and then they put us touch, in touch with NHSX. So from, you know, it was only approved by FDA on 23rd of March 2020 and we are we are in April. We've already done six months of pilot. So from somewhere in America for this to come to somewhere in Redker and Cumbria, you couldn't have done without the collaboration of colleagues. So going on to some practical myth busting, Lauren, I, I know our colleagues have asked lots of questions. Do you want to? run them through i'll try to answer yep. as much as i can no problem so we've got 14 questions oh, yeah. that have okay. been sent through from our um, clinicians so the first question is are there any other uses of the alive core six lead ecg device alongside qtc measurement yeah i think uh, as a as a device i've already mentioned this is like a tiny device and uh, it you know, the only difference is it, it comes in two varieties. There is the original version only had two electrodes. This one has another third electrode on the back. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it creates a triangle mm -hmm. like a, between your arm and your knee. That triangle completes the triangle. That's how you get the six lead. So mm -hmm. more data is provided. So it does provide you know, the previous version already been used across the country. I think if I'm right, Phil, you may know more than 6,000, 6 to 10,000 devices are used across the AHSN uh, kind of yes. a, a roadmap uh, that they have got it for atrial fibrillation screening. So, so it can use to diagnose atrial fibrillation, some of the arrhythmias, it can give you information on tachycardia, high heart rate, bradycardia, but one thing it, wouldn't do is, you know, it's going to give you acute cardiac event like a heart attack or something. So let's mm -hmm. be careful that this is not used to rule out a cardiac event. Okay, thank you. lovely, thank you. Um, question number two, do you need to physically measure QTC? Yes, we do. Uh, so what I'm going to do while we are on that subject, I'm just going to quickly share my screen uh, and then show people how it is done so that I just want to when people worry that is it going to be too difficult or something like that. So we use that. It's a freely available app. I, I don't have any specific uh, uh, ally, um, alliance to this. So what we tend to use is you, you've got all the various methods. Our normal device, uh, our automatic device produces Bazet, but some of the high cardiac rates uh, it cannot uh, predict better, so we use the Fredericia. For example, if the heart rate is uh, 85, and then I mentioned about the small squares, so that's between the uh, QT interval. So if you change it to how many small boxes, mm -hmm. and then if you put eight small boxes, there you go. It it just gives you that. Uh, so, for example, if it is 100, sorry, 100, actually the QT changes, whereas same way if it is 60, the QT changes, and same way if the, if the, this number changes, um, 7, the QT will be different, so 
now if it is 28. So the QT will change accordingly. So it is as simple as that. So you just have to use the uh, freely available app to use it. But there are, yeah, go on the next question. Thank you. Um, OK, number three, what is advised if the ECG looks abnormal? Yeah, first thing is we already talked about if the patient is symptomatic, first thing to do, anything a clinician will do. You walk into the patient for a routine monitoring and the patient is saying, I'm not feeling very well. I've got a bit of a chest pain. I've got a breathlessness. Your action depends on what is that the patient is suffering from. So it goes into the medical mode of assessment. So asymptomatic patient with an abnormal ECG, highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. So if the patient has problem, use your local trust policy on how you will deal with a deteriorating patient. Right, OK. Yeah. Thank you. Um, when is it appropriate to use the Alive Car 6 lead ECG? OK, so as you, we all know currently, we use the ECG in a, I'm talking about mental health psychiatric practice for mm -hmm. QT monitoring. Mm -hmm. So it has been validated to use the QT in this device, but it doesn't completely replace the 12 lead ECG. So you may be, you know, if in doubt there are there are occasions when the, the graph is not clear, the recording is not clear, you might need to come to check with the, another ECG. So you would use it. But if it is, you know, as I explained, if the ECG is fairly clear, you're able to have a good uh, assessment of the ECG. I do not see any reason why you need to go back to the 12 lead, but it's not going to completely replace as of now. Yeah, okay, thank you. Does the patient need to prepare anything such as downloading an app? No, currently, because this is going to be service delivered, so we will be downloading the app in our work mobile mm -hmm. and the device does not hold any data. So even if this device is lost, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. okay. And our work mobiles are encrypted. And even if, even if it is found, you only have an ECG with a number which has yep. no relationship. So it is fairly safe. Great, thank you. Does the app cost anything? Right. If the app itself doesn't cost from the purchase of the device and the app, it is linked. Mm -hmm. the, the company offers further enhanced services, but for our current use, you do not need such services. So sometimes as an automatically, because you have signed up to the app, it might show a pop up saying that, do you want to upgrade? It might cost you three pounds, eight pounds. So as of right now, we do not need any upgradable version. So no cost involved from the uh, purchaser side of it. Yeah, lovely. Um, what happens if there is an update? Okay, the, again, the device itself doesn't need any calibration, but the app itself automatically up, up, updates like a software does for any of our devices, mm -hmm. and it will be an automatic upgrade over the cloud. Mm -hmm. Lovely, thank you. Um, where should the device be stored? Okay, uh, obviously safely. Uh, not because of anything, but, you know, it is very flimsy. It's easy to stay in a, a back of the handbag or something. And then so be mindful where it is. I prefer to keep it in the box so that it is safe. Uh, in our teams, we've got two devices for the whole team. So they have a specific place. They've got like a little cupboard so people can use it. Yeah. OK, thank you. Are there any concerns regarding digital safety or information governance? I've touched upon it briefly, but as I have mentioned, it is about practice. Use your own local guidance. One thing I'm going to be clear, there is no need to put any patient identifiable information there except your electronic patient record number so that you need to go through various password procedure to access that number to link to the patient. So apart from that, for example, if a particular ECG is lost, 
somebody else gets hold of it, you've got a wiggly ECG with some six digit number. It can it can it cannot take it to the patient. Yeah, OK, thank you. How long does the battery life last? The manufacturer say it can last up to two years, but I didn't I don't even know when it was manufactured until it was shipped. But the company advises annual replacement. It is I think it's a two zero three two or two zero one six, one of those coin type of batteries. Yeah. And we have put a link on how to change the battery. Yeah. Basically got like a little screws, like a watch screw. You take it out, pop the battery, put the pack on, it's fine. And if the battery is low, your app will show indication that it is low. OK, perfect. Thank you. Do you have any advice if you struggle to get an ECG reading? Yeah, I think we find that uh, again as we started using sometimes it's the it's the skin contact. So we do advise patients to wash their hands so that it's you know not necessarily it needs to be dripping with water because if it's an oily hand or something like that and then they need to hold it and then put it on the knee. But what sometimes find is with the thumb, the contact may not be adequate. What this advice is hold it with the palm mm -hmm. and then put it on the knee so you get a higher surface area so that it is easy to use that. And the other thing you can do is there are patients who might come in to the clinic with a very tight jeans, which happened a few weeks ago for me. What you need is just put a drop of water on the jeans and then you can make a skin contact. Mm -hmm. And also if the uh, waves are a little interrupted, you can put a drop of water and then you can wet your finger and then put it on. That's more than enough and then you can wipe it dry. Yeah, yeah. lovely, thank you. Um, does this, I think we might have covered this, but does does this replace the 12 lead ECG device? No, it doesn't. Yeah, which I've already explained. Yeah. Yeah. Is the quality <clears throat> of the ECG reading or QTC interval adequate? Yeah, which which we explained. I'm just going to for uh, repeat repetition purposes. I'm just going to show the uh, information for people. You can see how good the ECG uh, graph is. So if you think of a paper ECG, which I'm used to, you get some wiggly ECG, you don't know what it is. The beauty is now because it's on a PDF, you can actually expand it, look at the configuration of the ECG, and most of the ECGs are similar high quality. So I do not have any concern about the quality of the ECG recording. Okay. Um, can other abnormalities be diagnosed using the Alive Core 6 lead device, such as heart attack? No, which I've already explained. It yep. might show, but this is not a definitive mode for that. OK, that's all the questions. Thank you, Krish. Fantastic. And then again, uh, with regard to coming back to sharing and spreading, we have got our academic health sciences network. I just want to share my screen again to show where it is available. Uh, uh, yeah, so if you if you go to the website for the Academic Health Sciences Network website, uh, we will put the link. You've got in the information, clinical guidance, resources. Uh, Phil and colleagues are regularly updating that. And then probably the company might have various information as well that if you go to a live car uh, and also, uh, as I mentioned, we will be putting some of those information in the AHSN website. Yeah. Any other questions for uh, for us, Lauren or Phil, apart from the prepared ones? No. No. So I think we, we have tried our best to cover kind of a usually asked questions and also from shop to practice, how it is going to be the coming back to summarizing it. The device is validated. The device is licensed, uh, so it's not something we have done it lightly and it, it is currently going through our digital safety case and already we have got the um, uh, digital DPIA, which has been approved yesterday. Uh, Lawrence. So, and then our colleagues in CNTW, it has gone through their rigorous procedure as well. Uh, am I right that they're going to start the pilot very soon, Phil? Yes, we uh, we start our team meetings 
next week and we're looking to deploy the first couple of devices in a clinical setting within the outpatient department within hopefully fingers crossed by the end of this month and then to start collecting data and replicate the wonderful work in Tuvi. Yeah, and the other thing to say is even though we have done in a very formal structured way, uh, I presented our poster to one of our conference and then we found that sporadically across the country people have been using it. Uh, so it's not like I'm not going to say that you know, um, it is a bad practice, but at, at the same time, we are probably the first in the country or probably in the world where we use this to this level in a structured way. And, you know, again, this calculation is all on the back of an envelope calculation, but we are also hoping to do a good economic evaluation. So I do think that we are fortunate to have that support whereby it not only we just, you know, get it off the Amazon and just get it. It's not like that we did. We collaborated with the manufacturer, collaborated with the scientific community and to make sure that we are doing it properly so that our patients are benefited. And hopefully th with this recording, you may be able to uh, get this similar pilot in your own work area. So thank you for your attention. Hope this video was useful to you.